Welcome back to Gardens and Grub All Things Food. Uh, today we're going to talk about a loved vegetable, but also an often hated vegetable by certain kids out there if you were forced to eat them as a child and you didn't like them. Um, uh, we're going to talk for a little while about this particular food, um, and then we're going to open it up for questions. So uh, feel free to raise your hand um, or uh, chat in, right in the chat box in Zoom, or you can message us on Facebook. So today we are going to talk about all different kinds of peas. So the reason I presented these peas first is because they're my favorite kind of peas to eat. So this pea here is a sugar snap pea. It's kind of thick and you can actually eat the whole thing, the pod and the pea. And this is a snow pea. It's much thinner and um, very, very delicious. So um, these can be eaten raw, they can be eaten cooked. Often you'll find snow peas in, um, you'll find them in American Chinese cooking. So they're not used a ton over in China like they are here. Um, snow peas are used in, in all kinds of vegetable dishes uh, when you go to Americanized Chinese restaurants. So some peas are uh, stringless and some have strings. So let me show you what that means if you've never shelled peas before. So a string is this part that's holding together this part of the pea. And so you take it and you strip it off. You don't have to do this. This is, um, this makes it nicer to eat when it's raw because this part's really, really chewy. It's full. It's just a, basically a big string of cellulose, which is very healthy and digestible fiber for our, our gut. Um, and we'll talk about fiber in a little bit. Um, but these, this makes it a little bit less, um, I would say toothsome. Um, so you can peel this off and it becomes really nice. Um, especially if you're going to serve them raw, if you're going to cook them, it actually softens the fiber. So you don't need to remove it. Um, so peas botanically are actually a fruit, which I thought was really interesting. And uh, what I grow in my garden, I grow snow peas and sugar snap peas because they're really easy to harvest. One plant will give you tons and tons of peas, not tons and tons, but probably 20 peas on a plant. And plants you can put basically an inch and a half apart and grow them on a trellis. And they're very easy to grow. They don't take a lot of nutrients to grow and they actually put nutrients in the soil, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but I like to just pick them and eat them. I'm a busy person. So some people will grow peas for shelling. So shelling peas are where, where you let the peas mature on in the pod on the, the vine. And then you pick them near the end of the season. You peel off the, the string if they have a string and then you break them open and the peas are on the inside. So um, although this is a sugar snap pea, so you can eat the whole thing. Um, when you grow peas, even the, the shelling variety, if you pick them when they're really young, you can actually eat the whole thing. So um, freezing them is really easy as well if you're not gonna do shelling peas. Shelling peas, you can can them, you can freeze them, um, but just make sure to take them out of the pod first. Um, drying, shelling, canning. Um, but if you are going to can them, you want to make sure to use a, um, a pressure canner and uh, because it's going to be a low acid food. The pH is going to be near neutral. And since because of that, you'll have to pressure can them. Don't eat water bath canned peas unless they have a ton, ton, ton of vinegar in them. Um, if you desire to learn how to can, I highly recommend it. It's a great pastime. Um, look up the National Center for Home Food Preservation. Um, never take a card out of that's, you know, 100 years old. I know your grandma used to can just like that and everybody was fine. Um, but pathogens are different now. We actually have science on uh, what exactly is safe. And water bath canned foods have to be high acid foods. And um, pressure canned foods are the low acid foods. And those are more dangerous because if you don't can them correctly, um, they can grow botulism. So um, we have to be very, very careful with that. But the National Center for Home Food Preservation, it's a division of the USDA. They're constantly updating recipes and testing. So you can um, take a recipe that your uh, grandmother made and compare it to the recipe in those books. And um, it, I mean, on the website and see how similar it is. Um, you're welcome to call your local extension agent, your family consumer sciences agent, and he or she will help you um, figuring out uh, how to um, 
to use because you should use the same recipe from um, the home food preservation website. Um, but if it's a matter of adding like garlic powder or something like that, something that doesn't change the pH, um, it may not make much of a difference, but you'll need to consult a professional to do that. So back to peas. Peas um, are uh, delicious and grassy flavored. They are actually an annual, but they're not frost tender. So you can actually plant these when other things, when the soil is, is about 50 degrees is when these guys will sprout. Um, they're just super, super easy to grow um, from the time you plant them, if you plant them at the right time, um, to the time you harvest is anywhere from 55 to 70 days, depending on the variety. But what's great about them is that they'll sprout on a warm day, they'll grow, and then like, you know, this week on Thursday and Friday night, we're going to have 30 degree temperatures. You don't have to worry about your peas. Your peas will be absolutely fine because they're not quite big enough to, um, they're not quite big enough to, to uh, have flowers or pods on them yet, so they won't freeze. Well, they'll freeze, but they have kind of their own antifreeze. They'll thaw out in the day and be just fine. I pulled this plant out of my garden this morning so that you could take a look at it. This is a pea plant. So pea plants, actually, you can eat the shoots and the leaves. Um, they're totally edible. And this is a legume. So we're going to talk about legumes today. Um, they're a very interesting class of plants. And in fact, we're gonna talk about different kinds of legumes over the next few weeks. So first we're gonna do peas, then we're gonna talk about peanuts because peanuts are not a nut, they're actually a legume. And then we're gonna talk about beans in general at the end. And I have a whole bean library I'm gonna show you, it'll be great. So, but this is a pea plant and um, it grows different than peanuts and it grows different than beans. Um, there are bush peas, which make a little bush. And then there are vining peas that are kind of the most common varieties. Um, Often you can grow peas that are green. You can grow them when they're yellow and you can also grow sometimes pea pods. Actually, let me see if I can find it. You can get purple varieties, which is really, really neat. So um, uh, when you cook them, they actually lose the purple color, but you can serve them raw if you pick them. Like this is a shelling pea, but if you uh, pick them when they're small, when you can eat the whole thing, you actually get the benefit of the um, highly antioxidant purple, uh, purple pigments in here, the anth anthocyanins, and you can slice them up. And because purple is kind of rare in the diet. So if you're serving a salad and there's little purple bits in there, people kind of wonder what it is. Uh, it's very, very delicious. So, um, but yeah, this is a pea plant. So I also want to bring to your attention these little tendrils right here. Um, so you don't have to tie these up. You just plant them up a, a um, uh, like a chicken wire fence or a, um, like a chain link fence is perfect to grow these on. You plant them an inch to an inch and a half apart and you spread them out. You know, you can plant whatever, 40 or 50 of them in a row. They come up on their own and these little guys will automatically, they're, they're constantly moving until they find a support and they'll grab and wrap around the support and continue to pull the plant upward, upward, upward. It's really quite interesting. They kind of have a little personality all their own. Um, you can see that this is growing in a peat pot. Normally. Uh, there's certain plants that don't do well transplanted and peas are one of them. Peas are much better if they are direct seeded into the soil. Um, I pulled this one up and I intend on putting it back where I found it. So I put it in a peat pot. If you must grow things that don't like to be transplanted, things like cucumbers, squash, peas, and any root crops, like if it's a beet or if it's a um, beets or carrots, you don't do starts. Don't go to the, the store and try to look for little starts like this, little seedlings like this. Um, if people are selling them, I, I, I don't really like the scruples of that particular garden center um, because root crops and peas are meant to be planted directly, seeded into the ground. Cucumbers are a little different. You can get away with pre-planting them, cucumbers and squash. They're not as sensitive on their roots. There's just certain plants that do not like their roots touched or messed with. Um, so the way that I would replant this in the ground is I would tear out the bottom of this peat pot, slice it in a couple of places, and just set it right down into the ground and bury it to the top. And then what it will basically do is grow back out and, uh, and all of the little, this will start to break down and all of the little um, pea roots can come out of this and this uh, peat pot actually enriches the soil. So if you must, start peas, or if you're a teacher and you wanna show germination, you can actually soak the peas overnight in, in, in water, um, strain them and put them in a, um, a paper towel in a Ziploc bag, and then look at them a couple of days later and you'll see them germinate. So you can teach about germination and then you can plant them in a peat pot 
and watch this grow. And it's just a wonderful thing for kids to do. Um, one of my uh, favorite master gardeners, Beth Austin um, here in uh, Durham, North Carolina, we're gonna do a sunflower project. Sunflower seeds are another thing that don't like to be transplanted. So rather than peat pots, she's gonna use um, all of her coffee cups that she generated during quarantine from your Starbucks and your Dunkin' Donuts and all the places that she got them. And we're actually gonna do the sunflowers in peat pots and write the name of the, the child here. So then we plant them outside, the child can see which one they planted, how it sprouted, what color it is when it grows. So this is just a fun little project to do. So peas. Now, oh, really quickly, let's talk about the roots of these. So besides not liking to be disturbed, um, all legumes have rhizobia. So basically what rhizobia are, let me show you how that word is spelled, rhizobia, are the friends of legumes and they're bacteria, they're symbiotic bacteria. So the reaction they do is they capture atmospheric nitrogen. We're breathing in nitrogen from the atmosphere all the time when we breathe it out. Our body doesn't really use it for reactions unless we consume it orally. Um, and then it turns it into ammonia so that um, the rhizobia, what they do is they trap the atmospheric nitrogen, they're little bacteria that live in, in the roots in on and around um, the roots of legumes. And they capture atmospheric nitrogen, turn it into a nitrogen that the plant can use because all plants need nitrogen in order for leaf growth. That's primarily what they use it for. Um, and um, so you don't have to add nitrogen in fertilizer to legumes because they can make it on their own with their little buddy rhizobia that live in their roots. And in exchange, for the, um, the nitrogen that the rhizobia give to the pea, the pea um, creates starch and sugar because that's what autotrophs plants do is they capture CO2 from the air, carbon dioxide that we breathe out. <sighs> we breathe out carbon dioxide and the plants capture it and turn it into starch and sugar. And then they feed that to the rhizobia. So it's a symbiotic relationship. It means interdependent. They need to feed each other. Not all plants have this, um, and just mainly legumes. And so, uh, so peas, beans, vetch, clover, even kudzu. Kudzu is a legume. Um, it's the family Fabaceae or Fabaceae. Um, and they feed the soil and the soil feeds them basically, which is really interesting. Now, people say, oh, grow legumes because it's good for the soil. The only way that it's good for the soil is, a, so if I get done with this pea plant, I've enjoyed all the peas that I want. If I rip out this pea plant and throw it in the forest or the garbage, it's not gonna help my garden bed because the nitrogen is trapped in the leaves. So what you do is when you pull up your pea plants, you either put them in your compost pile because the compost ends up back on your garden or you can chop them up into little pieces and, uh, and just lay them on the surface of the soil. And that will choke out weeds for your summer crops. It will keep weeds from growing because it will shade the surface of the soil. It'll trap water in the soil, which is good. You won't have to irrigate as much. And then as it breaks down, it releases that nitrogen into the soil and the bacteria will eat it up and feed it to your plants. So um, it's a wonderful thing to do. This is why a lot of times people will do cover crops. So farmers often, you know, you go to the grocery store and you buy whatever vegetables, um, you know, the experience of the farmer, they have to put a lot of, uh, they have to feed those plants that you end up eating. And so um, they can either buy fertilizer that we make, or they can, they can grow their own fertilizer and growing legumes is a way to grow your own fertilizer because it traps the, the nitrogen that we're breathing, it traps it in the plant and you can get a cash crop off of this by harvesting, um, you can harvest the peas off of it, but then you can chop this up and leave it on the surface of the soil and it will feed your, uh, your carrot crop that you put in or your tomato crop that you put in in the next season. So they call it green manures when you grow a cover crop. Clover is also one of those crops. Clover is wonderful. It's got a really small seed. You spread it out. It's got a beautiful flower that bees love. And even though you don't get a cash crop off of it, like a, a bean or a pea or a peanut, um, you actually get free nitrogen that you didn't have to buy. Um, and it also, um, whenever we grow more plants, 
and um, they breathe in more CO2, we actually are correcting climate change where we're helping it because not only is this plant trapping atmospheric nitrogen, but it's also uh, sequestering carbon. All plants sequester carbon, everyone, not just, uh, not just beans. So when you plant trees or when you grow vegetables, um, when you grow plants, even your house plants, um, they breathe in some of the CO2 that we're putting off when we burn fossil fuels. So it's a good idea to garden. You do a lot of really great things for the environment when you, when you have a garden. So pea plants. All right, so let's talk about some other ways to eat peas. One of my favorite ways in the winter to eat peas is split peas. So split peas are super nutritious. Um, all peas have a lot of fiber in them. So we all need fiber. We need at least 28 grams a day, which is like an ounce of fiber. Um, what fiber does is it keeps us regular. Um, we can use the rest restroom every day, which is very important. Um, but also it lowers your blood cholesterol um, because there are insoluble fibers, the ones that your body can't digest. Um, you eat the fiber, it fills you up, but your body can't digest it. So you feel very full but there's no calories in those particular molecules because your body can't break them down. And so you feel full um, and it keeps your body regular um, and it passes right through you. Insoluble fibers are like kind of gummy fibers. Like when you break open a piece of okra or a cactus and it's got that kind of gummy, kind of like if you've ever broken a, a fresh aloe vera spear and it's got that gumminess, um, that is a soluble fiber. And those are really important when they go through your gut. Um, there's a big network of uh, veins and arteries that, and capillaries actually that go all around your intestines. And what, what those are doing are um, taking up molecules that you need and putting off molecules that you don't. They're getting rid of molecules that are waste out of your bloodstream. Um, also it goes like through your liver because your liver is sort of like a, um, the headquarters of all digestion and hormone making. Um, love your liver, everyone. It's one of the most important parts of you. So um, through all of those blood vessels, if you have a large amount of soluble fiber traveling through your intestine, your body has the ability to let go of oxidized cholesterol, which is your LDLs, your, uh, your sort of bad cholesterol um, is actually able to exit your body much more frequently if you have a lot of soluble fiber in your diet. Peas happen to have a lot of soluble fiber. Uh, most plants do. This is why we want you to eat fruits and vegetables at least five servings a day, if not nine, if you can get them in there. Um, but this is a great way to, uh, to get um, delicious fiber in your diet. And it's also very, very tasty. Um, these take a lot longer to cook. So you can mix these two together and you'll get kind of an interesting color. But I like these by themselves or these by themselves because they do turn into like a porridge or a sauce. They turn into like a, a liquid um, when they cook down. If you want them to cook a little bit faster, what you can do is put just a pinch or two of baking soda and it will break down some of the fibers in here when you're cooking them and cause them to cook a little bit faster. You can fry up a little onion, a little country ham with that if you want, if you're into pork, um, or you can leave them vegetarian altogether and uh, and fry up a little garlic with that um, and then dump these in, put in some water, um, maybe a bouillon cube if you like that, um, and then just cook them slowly with plenty of water um, for two to three hours. And it's a great thing to do when you're cleaning the house or you're, you know, working in the garage or whatever. When you're home, you can put it on the back burner on low and then set a timer for about every half an hour to go and stir it. Because what will happen is that as they cook, the sort of solid part will fall to the bottom and then you'll have the liquid part on the top. So you got to stir that up to hydrate these as they're cooking so they can absorb moisture. And then, and then you can take that and since it's such a dense soup, it freezes really well. So you can have, you know, make, if you're going to spend three hours cooking something, you might as well make two or three extra meals and then just freeze it in containers and you're ready with a fresh, delicious soup anytime you want it. That's mainly how I do it is I always cook a lot and then freeze it because I don't like leftovers that much. Um, so I can only eat even a really good meal like two times in a row. I just can't eat all week the same thing. So I will freeze it and then put it in the freezer and then pull something else out of there like, um, you know, last week's or last month's, you know, barbacoa or korma or whatever I made. Um, but this is a very wonderful thing for to cook for vegetarians because it's also very rich in protein. So all legumes are very rich in protein. And that is because of rhizobia. Um, 
their proteins are made of amino acids and amino acids all have nitrogen. It's the nitrogen groups that we get in our diet are from, um, are from amino acids. And those are the building blocks of protein. So when they talk about how legumes are very rich in protein, that's because rhizobia has given the nitrogen, lots of nitrogen groups to these plants and they're able to create amino acids that we consume and our body refashions into the ones that we need, except for the essential amino acids. There's nine essential amino acids that we have to get from our diet. Our body cannot, our liver cannot refashion them into other, um, or none of the ones that we eat can be refashioned into the essential ones. So that's why they're essential. There are 22 known amino acids, nine of them we have to eat for, and then our body, our liver can take those and turn them into other amino acids that we might need. So um, now this is not a complete protein. So a complete protein means it has all the essential amino acids, all nine. If I ate this, it would have all nine. It doesn't. You have to pair this with a grain. So it doesn't mean you need to eat it the same every meal, but if you eat this with a piece of toast or um, you, you eat some of these with, uh, you know, like a, a like rice or something, a grain and a bean together, they both, a grain by itself or a bean by itself, they both lack a, one or two essential amino acids. But if you eat them together, then you have a complete amino, a complete amino acid profile, a complete protein, they call it just like as if you were eating meat or eggs, anything from an animal has all the essential amino acids. You don't even need to worry about it. But there are also some other foods that have all of the essential amino acids like chia seed, flax seed, um, lots of things. We won't go into it. Um, we're going to be talking about plant proteins a lot over the next few weeks. So, or the next, next few episodes. So we'll go into that a little bit deeper as time goes on. Another wonderful way to eat peas is you'll find these frozen peas. I love frozen vegetables. There's also canned peas. There's a couple of vegetables that I'll eat canned. All vegetables in pretty much all forms are good. Um, however, uh, I prefer frozen just because to me, they taste better and they're also not trapped in salt water. So these have a lot of salt in them in order to reduce the salt by about half. I recommend if you're going to eat um, canned vegetables, uh, put them in a strainer and run water over them, drain them and run water over them. And you can wash a lot of the salt off of um, canned vegetables. So I would do that um, before you use them. Canned peas and canned corn are great. They're, they're, to me, not as good as fresh or frozen, but pretty close. Um, but there's certain things like canned spinach. I can't do it. It was one of those things that um, my mom made me eat with liver and onions one time when I was probably six or seven years old. And now fresh spinach all day long. Half my garden right now is planted in fresh spinach. I will pick it until it goes to seed. Like it is the most delicious thing to me. Um, but if it's in a can, I can't do it. So this is another public service announcement. Don't force your kids to eat things. You can entice them. You can encourage them. You can introduce new foods right at the beginning of a meal before they've eaten anything else when they're really hungry. Um, tastes change as we grow. So you can train them to take a no thank you bite where they take one bite just to see if they like it. There's a lot of kids that will develop tastes for things over time. And just because they don't like it now doesn't mean they're never gonna like it because our tastes change as we age. We're born with about 10,000 taste buds, um, like, like a super, like a super wine taster, basically. And then as we age, by the time we pass away, we have between four and 6,000 taste buds. So our tastes literally change because um, we have less and less taste buds as we grow. So don't force a kid because, you know, just like Ronald Reagan, I think, or George Bush would not eat uh, broccoli. It's because his mom forced him to do it. And then once you become an adult, you never do it again. So anyway, peas. Peas are one of the things that you could either love or you could hate. These kind of frozen peas are great. Um, you'll see a lot of times on the market, these microwave in bag meals. Technically you can microwave them in the bag. However, you see how pliable this plastic is? The stuff that makes plastic pliable is called plasticizers. And if you microwave it, it will end up in your food. And you don't want that because they're endocrine disruptors. They mimic hormones in our body. And you really don't want that. They don't really know what exactly they do. And so buy them like this and then get yourself, everybody has this at home, a glass bowl, just a regular glass bowl. Put your peas in there. If you want to put a little butter in there, you can. You can do this for any, any fresh vegetables, any frozen vegetables. Put them in your glass bowl, slide a little plate on top, microwave it for a few minutes, and then take it out, stir it and check it. But make sure when you take it out, 
you use a dry towel, okay? It has to be dry because a wet towel, it, it conducts heat. Um, a dry towel will not. So just make sure to remove this like so, take it out, stir it, test it, and put it back in. Um, this way, uh, glass is non-reactive, um, so it will not put anything into your food that you don't want in your food. If you're microwaving in any kind of plastic right now, one of the great things you can do for your health is to stop doing that and use this. You can stop today and your body will, will eventually um, get rid of a lot of those, uh, those plasticizers that are in there. But we're just exposed to so many plastics in the world. And when you go out to eat, people are going to microwave something with plastic wrap on top of it. Like you can't really stop it out in the wide world, but in your home, in order to reduce environmental contaminants, you can do really simple things like not microwaving in plastic anymore. Um, and this is a preventative health thing that you can do for your family. So um, I think the last thing, check here. Um, oh, wow. I was just talking. I should definitely open it up for questions. If you're going to plant peas, plant them now. Um, it's just about time to plant peas a month ago to now. Okay, so let me open it up for questions. Sherilyn, thank you so much. Um, I'm really excited because just last week, my mom was ex asking me to explain what an endocrine disruptor is. So now you've done it. Hopefully she's watching today as usual. Mimicking uh, hormones in our body. That's right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I've got two great questions um, I'm going to read to you. The first one is, do legumes contain more nitrogen in the leaves than any other type of plant? Why are they considered a good cover crop when all plants have nitrogen nitrogenous compounds? I thought that the nitrogen benefit was in the roots because the rhizobia, boy, I'm having a hard time today, are stored in there. Is my impression incorrect? Yes. So excuse me if I don't hear very well, just because the speaker is messed up on this particular computer. My other one that works, uh, the internet was not accessible by it today. Um, so uh, from what I understand from the question, um, you're thinking that most of the nitrogen is in the roots. Um, actually, there are all plants use nitrogen. Um, they have to in order to make leaves. That's what the three numbers are on fertilizers in PK. And so all plants require nitrogen but you have to put it in through some outside source like fertilizer or compost or something when you're trying to grow plants. Um, with, uh, with you, there, there may be more, a little bit more um, nitrogen in the roots because the rhizobia are there, but the entire plant requires nitrogen. So the benefit of a plant that makes its own nitrogen is you don't have to put inputs. So while you could take you know, all of your, you know, uh, if you had um, like a wheat straw or something, which is not, it does not have rhizobia because it's a grain and it does not make its own nitrogen. You could still chop that up and it would be beneficial to the ground by choking out weeds and still breaking down nitrogen. The way that that plant got its nitrogen is you had to put it on there with something. This it's free. You just you grow it, it does it itself. So when you chop it up and put it on the ground, you, earlier in the growing, you did not put any inputs into this. So you can leave the roots in the ground if it's a small, you know, these small plants. Um, you can just cut them off at the ground and chop them up, or you can even pull them up and let them die on the surface of the ground. Either way, the previous inputs from the previous season, you didn't spend any money on them, which is why these are a very valuable crop for, especially farmers who do acres and acres and acres and acres you know, if they grow garbanzo beans or lentils, they can grow, go through, harvest all of those with a combine, come through, chop them all up and leave them on the surface and they get free fertilizer for the next mm -hmm. season. That's great. Um, next question. Are split peas the same thing as lentils? They're both, uh, they are both uh, fabaceae. So they are both legumes. Um, but they are not the same. If you've ever seen a lentil, it's a flat little like round guy, looks like a little spaceship. Um, and, and these guys are perfectly cylindrical. Also, peas take a lot longer to cook. Lentils take 25 to 35 minutes, depending on how old they are. Sometimes if they've been sitting around for a year or two, they're a little bit drier and they'll take longer to cook. Um, but those, you know, you can decide you want lentils and be eating in less than an hour. Um, these guys, you got to really think ahead. So um, you can put them in a crock pot all day if you want to, and that works great. Put them on low. Awesome. But they, they are from the same family, but they are not the same plant. And I've never seen anybody eat fresh lentils. I'm sure if you had them growing in the yard, you could, um, but they're primarily made, they're grown for the, um, the, the dry bean market. Interesting. Thank you. 
Um, so this is more of a comment. Um, many canned foods contain BPA in the lining as well. I avoid canned foods because of this. Mm -hmm. Yes, so that is very true um, for all of you out there. Um, these have, now they may have taken BPA out, which is bis bisphenol A, which is a plasticizer. It's what makes plastic, you know, this plastic is real hard right here. It has less plasticizer, still has it, but less plasticizers than plastics that are real pliable. Um, because basically, if you can imagine, um, plastics are polymers and they, they're like strings of beads. And in order to hook those together to make the plastic do this, it needs sort of almost like a rubberized molecule in between. Um, and, and definitely like a can of soda has a plastic liner, canned food has a plastic liner. They all have plastic liners and they can this and then they heat it up to like, um, it's got to be like 260 degrees Fahrenheit. They do that because they can do it under pressure because water boils at 212 at, atmos at atmospheric pressure where we're all breathing and hanging out now. So in order to get to drive up the temperature, the boiling temperature inside of here, it's done under pressure. Um, that's why pressure canning low acid foods is important because botulism spores die at uh, 200 and, ooh, don't quote me, 260 degrees, 240 degrees, I believe. I'll find out for you next week. I should know this. I know it. I just can't think of it now, but higher than I think it's 260 degrees botulism spores die. And because of that, that's why they commercially can these. It's much safer than canning at your home. Um, but there is a plastic liner so that this doesn't rust. And so you are exposing yourself to, they may not use bisphenol A anymore, but they had to substitute it with something. So they'll tweak the chemical a little bit and then sell it and say, oh,